Yes, scripture comes out of Mark chapter 5, starting at verse 21 through the end of the chapter. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and and thronged around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, but was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well." And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story that is going to encourage us this morning in times of suffering. Lord, as we know, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. And so the the scripture says that we are to be thankful in all things, in all ways. And so, Lord... We thank you for you and your creation. God the Father who spoke and sent his Son and and, and Jesus Christ who came and lived the perfect life in our place and died on the cross for our sin. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit in which you sent after the resurrection and you ascended to the Father. You sent us the Spirit to lead, guide, and direct us. Lord, you've given us your word now to inform us on how to live in, in this world and how to praise you and how to worship you and how to love others. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the community in which you've given us here at the crossing where we can bear one another's another's burdens and encourage one another and lift up one another in prayer to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, thank you that you are a good father who hears your children's prayers and who is intimately involved in our daily lives. And this is what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. So, Mark chapter 5, 21 through 43. I want to ask you guys a question this morning. What is your favorite Bible passage in the Scriptures? What is your favorite Bible passage? You're probably like me, and it's like, well, there's too many to count. So, let me just rephrase the question. What is your top 10 list? What are your top 10 favorite Bible passages? When my wife asked me what we were going to preach on this week, I said, we're going to preach on Mark chapter 5. She goes, oh, that's one of my favorite passages. And it's one of mine too. If you would know my top 10 list, Mark chapter 5 would be in here. And the reason why I love Mark chapter 5 is because it talks about, it displays the power of Jesus. It displays his miraculous power through faith. Faith of ordinary people like you and me. And he takes two hopeless situations and turns them into joyful celebrations. That's why I love Mark chapter 5. And and Jesus did this 2,000 years ago with this lady in Jairus. And he's doing that today with us. And so let's look at this beautiful story. First, we see the request. The request in verses 21 through 24. 
Verse 21 says, And when Jesus had crossed again to the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Quick context, uh, Jesus is ministering in this region called the Sea of Galilee. He's, he's been on kind of the eastern side of Decapolis, these ten Gentile cities. He just healed this demon-possessed man, and, and he freaked out all the people. And so they didn't know what to do with him. And so Jesus, knowing this, just kind of snuck away, and he took a boat back to the kind of the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. And so this is where he's at. And in verse 22, he says, Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue. This is a massive cow, uh, crowd around Jesus because of his healings, because of his miracles that he's doing. He's got this crowd following him. And all of a sudden, we're introduced to this character named Jairus. Jairus, again, is a ruler of the synagogue. And Jairus makes a beeline to Jesus. He sees Jesus, and he makes a beeline to him. And it says, And seeing him, he fell at his feet. In verse 23, it says, They implored him earnestly, saying, my, do- my little daughter is at the point of death. And so what we see here is this, this religious man, this, this man of good standing in the community, the, the leader, the one that takes care of the synagogues, that takes care of Saturday worship. And we see that he's a desperate man because his little girl is to the point of death, literally on her last breath. And what we see here is we see this request from a humble, desperate father. Notice the intense anxiety in his request. It says, he implored him earnestly. He, he, he made a beeline to Jesus and fell on his face and implored him earnestly. He begged Jesus. He begged Jesus, my little daughter is sick, is at the point of death. And hear that tender affection in his voice when he says, my little daughter, my little daughter. I don't know about you, but uh, this hits me as a daddy of, of, of two daughters. I have five kiddos. My oldest and youngest are girls, and I have three boys in the middle. I have a sandwich. And um, we, we know that we're not, we're not called to show favoritism towards children. But if, if you're like me and been blessed with a couple of daughters, you know there's something very special, something unique about the daddy-daughter relationship. And, and, and when my little girls suffer, especially when they're younger, when, when my little girls suffer... It hits me in a, in, a, in a way even more so than when my, my boys suffer. And I don't know why that is, but it just, it just happens that way. And it doesn't matter if they're young, if they're 1, 2, 13, 12 in this area, or if they're still 23. My, my oldest is 23, my youngest is 16. There's still something happens in my heart when I see my daughter suffer. Jairus knows this as well. This, this is his only daughter, his only child, and he is grieved. The joy of his life is dying, and he will do anything to save her. And what we see here is the faith of Jairus. We see a faith of a loving father in verse 23. He says, my little daughter is at the point of death. And he implores Jesus, come and lay your hands on her so that for this purpose, for this purpose, Jairus makes a beeline to Jesus and says, come for this purpose so that she may be made well. That is the faith of the living Father. And we see in verse 24, he went with him. Again, Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum. He was a religious man. He, he knew Jesus. He, knew, he, he heard Jesus teach. In fact, he probably asked Jesus to come teach at his synagogue in Mark chapter 1, verse 21. He saw the authority of Jesus in his teachings and the way he could heal people. And he believed that Jesus could save his little girl. Therefore, he asks, he requests Jesus to come with him to his home and just, just, just lay your hands on her. That's all you need to do, Jesus. I know who you are. Just, just lay your hands on her and she will be healed. And we see Jesus accepts. Now, something really happened interesting in this story. There's a pause. We see there's an interruption in verse 24b through 34. The interruption, that takes us to the second point. We see in verse 24, it says, A great crowd followed him and thrown about him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. What's the reason for the pause? Well, Mark is using a, a literary technique here. It's called a Mark and Sandwich. As, as you guys recall, when we went through the book of Mark uh, about 10 years ago. Um, he would do this often. He wanted to, when Mark wanted to get a point across, he told a story within a story about the same topic. So here we have a, a story of healing within another story of healing. Again, he wants to drive home the point of Jesus' miraculous power and the faith of these individuals. So we have this sandwich, and that's the reason for the interruption here. And this healing deals with this woman who suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years. Obviously, this is not normal, but a a chronic hemorrhaging. 
And she has done everything in her power to seek help, to get healed. We see this in verse 26, and, and it says, And who had suffered much, this lady, under many physicians, many doctors. So she went to all these doctors, and, and they couldn't help her. And she spent all that she had and was no better, but got worse. So what we see here is we see this, this woman literally being tortured by this disease. She's suffering, but she's not only suffering physically, she's also suffering socially as well. Because this discharge of blood would make her um, unclean, richly unclean to have any kind of relationship with any of her family members or anyone in the community. It would isolate her much like a leopard according to the Old Covenant laws in Leviticus 15 through 33. So not only was she physically feeling the pain of this disease, but she was socially isolated. She was feeling the pain of living in isolation for 12 years years, all by herself. To any human being, that would be devastating. To any human being, that would be devastating because God has created us as relational creatures. He has created us to be in community. He has created us for physical interaction. In fact, we we see this in scientific studies all over the place, in particular with infants, but also adults. It says, the studies say that it's a vital role, that that physical uh, interaction is a vital role in people's mental and physical development as infants, and then also in our happiness as an adult. In fact, here's an interesting stat. A touch is the first sense that is um, created or developed in the womb of a child. The, The first sense that we get is touch. And it's the last scent that leaves us when we die out of our five senses. One, this therapist, uh, author of Virginia Satire said this, that human beings need four hugs a day for survival. So according to her study, you just need four hugs a day and you'll survive. Eight hugs a day for maintenance and 12 hugs, 12 hugs a day for growth. Now, I don't know about that, those stats and how scientific it is, but and as you guys know, I'm not a touchy-feely guy except for with my wife, um, which is good, um, and with my kids. I mean, I love to, when my kids were younger, I loved to hold them as babies. I loved to, like, toss them up in the air and hold them and cuddle with them. And even as they grew older, obviously that changed a little bit because now they don't like me to hug them. It'd be kind of awkward to see me hold Nate, six foot one, you know, dude, giving him a... But, but think about this woman. She couldn't do that. If she was married, she couldn't, she couldn't hug her husband. She couldn't kiss her husband. She couldn't lay in the same bed with her husband at night. If she, if she had children, she, she couldn't be a mom and, and caress her little baby. With, if her, if her, you know, her 12-year-old daughter was running, she fell and she scrubbed her knee or something, she couldn't pick her up and hold her. She couldn't even be a mom. She couldn't hang out with her girlfriends at the coffee shop. She was isolated, suffering physically and emotionally. We see that the only thing worse than suffering um, is suffering in isolation. It's suffering by yourself. Many people suffer, but at least they have a community around them. But when you're alone and isolated and you have no one there to, to pick you up, to give you a hug, to sit with you, man, that's devastating. And yet, through all of her suffering, it didn't stop her faith. It didn't stop her faith, her belief that Jesus could heal her. We read in verse 27, She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if I just touch even his garments or the hem of his robe, I will be made well. Notice in that the strength of her faith. She believed that he didn't have to touch her. He didn't have to speak to her. He didn't have to pray for her. She just had to get close to him to touch the hem of his garment and she would be healed. That was her faith. And that faith led her to action, and a bold action at that. Remember, she couldn't be around other people, and we have this, 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 this crowd around Jesus, like, she, like, like at a concert, like he's in the middle of this crowd, and all of a sudden she has to get through them. So what does she do? She cloaks herself probably. She covers her head, she covers her face, she, she, she makes her way through the crowd with her head down because she can't let anyone see her. She can't let anyone notice her because they'd be instantly, she would be in trouble. And she, and she puts herself in the line where Jesus was coming. 
And Jesus passes by and she bends down and she touches his garment. And what does the scripture say? Immediately, the blood stops flowing. Immediately, she is healed. The power of Jesus, we see, leaves him and by faith she is healed. Instant healing. Twelve years of shame, isolation, suffering, frustration are all resolved by her faith and touching Jesus' garment. What a story. Twelve years is a long time. Think about that. Twelve years being isolated, that's a, that's a long time to suffer. She could have easily got bitter. Got bitter at God, right? We know those type of people that, man, something bad happens to them and immediately their response is, what's up, God? Why is that happening to me? Instant bitterness at the Lord, angry at God. Notice she, she wasn't real pessimistic. She wasn't half a glass half empty. She didn't say, oh, it's just what it is. This is my plot in life. I'll just, I'll just grind it out. I'll just endure it. That wasn't her heart. No, her heart was, she was dependent. She saw that she had a need, and that dependence drove her to her only hope, which was Jesus. She, she drove, drove her to belief. It drove her to seek out Jesus by faith, knowing that he could heal her, and he does. Mark chapter 5, verse 30, it says, And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see that the crowd is pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched your garments? There's kind of some, you know, some, some humor in that. He's in this crowd, and, and Jesus is like, who touched my garments? You can, you, can, you can see, and it's Peter who says this, of course. Um, we see this story in Luke chapter 8. It's like, dude, Jesus, like, you're surrounded by a sea of humanity. Everyone's touching you. What do you mean, who, who's touching you? And he looked around to see who had done it. You see, Jesus wasn't asking a question for information but to draw this young lady out. Because that's what Jesus does. He is pursuing this lady. And Luke tells us that he's come to pursue and seek that which is lost. So he wants to, he's pursuing this lady. And he sees her in verse 20 and 33, the woman, they, you can almost think maybe they make eye contact. And verse 33 says, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him. And told him the whole truth. Why is she fearful? Well, again, because of, the, the, of her violating the Levitical laws of, of being unclean and the punishment that went with that. Not only did she touch all these people, but she touched a rabbi. She touched Jesus, who was a rabbi then. And, and, and back then, if an unclean person touched a rabbi, it was punishable by death. So that was one reason. Another reason why she just came in face to face with God. She was instantly healed. And the power of Jesus. So she was fearful because of that as well. But I want you to notice what Jesus does. Hear the words of a compassionate Savior. Hear the words of a heavenly Father. Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter. Think about Jairus. The, the, the same tone is right here from Jesus, just like it was with Jairus. He calls her daughter. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And be healed of your disease. So what at first it might, it might look like Jesus calling this lady out to make an example of her. To maybe rebuke her because of all the laws in the old covenant. But that's not what he's doing. Imagine the crowd's reaction as soon as she unveiled her head. You know, took off the hood. They would have probably just jumped back and gasped. And anger might have came over them. And they could have been expecting Jesus to again rebuke her. But he doesn't do that. Instead he calls her out to recognize her faith. He uses her as an example of what great faith is. And he shows his love for her as his own child. He calls her daughter. Daughter. There's a word that would dispel any fear that she might have had at that point, right? Not sister, not child, but daughter. This is the only time that Jesus calls or uses the word daughter in the scriptures to this young lady. Matthew 9 says that it adds, this story is also in Matthew 9, Luke 8, and Luke chapter 8, but Matthew 9 adds this. It says, take heart, daughter. 
Your faith has made you well. The, and the Greek word for made you well is sozo, which means to save. So not only did Jesus heal her physically, save her physically, but more important, he saved her spiritually. There's a conversion that happens here. And here's the point. You don't clean yourself up before coming to Jesus. You don't, you, there's nothing you can do to clean yourself up to come to Jesus. In fact, um, your contribution to the gospel, my contribution to the gospel is my sin, is my rebellion. That's what we bring. And Jesus says, bring it, all of you. Come as you are, just like this woman. He didn't say, go clean yourself up and then come back. No, he healed her immediately. See, this is what it talks about in the great exchange in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where Jesus takes upon himself our sin, all of it, and he gives us his righteousness. This is what's happening in this passage. This is the point of this passage. And that only happens by faith in Jesus Christ solely in his grace. So what we see is that faith opens the door to the power of forgiveness of Jesus. See, in my you know, 30 years of, of following Jesus, there's been a consistent theme or consistent pattern. And in almost 20 of those years, I've been in full-time ministry. And, and maybe you can relate to this pattern as well. Is when people come to Jesus, it's usually when they are suffering greatly, right? It's usually when they're in a deep, deep valley, that's when people look to Jesus. That's what makes people turn to Jesus. They've, they've tried everything in the world, trying to help themselves, trying to pull them up by their bootstraps, trying to get through this valley of despair, and nothing is working. So therefore, where do they turn? They don't look inward anymore. They look upward. They look to Jesus. This is what happened to me in my conversion. When I came first to know Jesus, I I saw an impossible situation and I tried to do it on my own. I tried to overcome it in my own power, my own strength, only to fail over and over and over again. And in my deepest time of despair, it caused me to not look inward anymore, but to look upward. To look to Jesus and put my faith in him. C.S. Lewis says this, God whispers to us in our pleasure but he shouts to us in our pain. He says pain and suffering is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Isn't that right? Is that true of you? Think about your conversion. Think about what brought you to Jesus. Was it when you were on the high and the mountaintops on the green pasture and everything was going well? Or was it, or was it when you saw that you had a desperate need that nothing else could fill but Jesus? So you repented of your sin, and you look to him as your savior. You trusted in him for salvation. You know, maybe maybe that's where some of you are this morning. You're in the surf of suffering, and, and the waves are just banging against you, mentally, physically, crash, crash, crash. And and you and you and, and you and you can't do anything about it. You're battered. The ways of despair, pain, confusion, physically and mentally, and you can't handle it anymore. Where do you go? Jesus says, look to me. Look to me. Get in my path, and I will make you well. So this morning, if you're in a realm of suffering, he's offering to rescue you from your suffering. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, come to me. That's the invitation Jesus is saying to you this morning. Come to me, all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you want to find rest this morning? Do you want to find rest in the midst of suffering? It's, It's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And he invites you this morning. So faith opens the door to the power of forgiveness in Jesus. And sometimes it's physical, right? I mean, there's times where some of you might have a chronic disease and you've been praying for healing and he hasn't healed you. And sometimes he will hear you, heal you, but sometimes he won't. But his grace is sufficient. He can still give you rest and peace in that. But it's always spiritual. He always 
will answer the call spiritually and give you peace and give you rest in your soul, even in the midst of difficult situations. And that takes us to our third and final point, the arrival. So we go back to Jairus, the arrival, verses 35 and 43. In verse 35, while he was still speaking, Jesus, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. As many of you guys know, if you've known me or been around the crossing, I lost my mom on Christmas Eve in the year of 1992. I was a young man, 20, 21 years old. And um, it was Christmas Eve. She had an allergic reaction and died uh, at a Christmas party. And I wasn't with her. My dad was. I was out with the boys hanging out. And I got this call. And my, and my dad said, you need to come to the hospital immediately. That's, uh, that was it. Just get, just get here immediately. And I, I went there. And the first words that he said to me, your mother is dead. Your mother is dead. Those are, those are paralyzing words. Especially at that moment. But could you imagine? People say, scientists say, sociologists say that the only thing worse than hearing your mom or dad dead is that your child is dead. Hmm. See, it doesn't matter if this happened 2,000 years ago in Jesus' day or if it happens today. Those words are paralyzing. Jesus sees the pain on Jairus' face. And immediately comforts him with this command. It's a command here. Do not fear, only believe. You see, we all know this, that that suffering is a part of of living in the Genesis 3 world. We can't can't escape it. As we studied in the book of Genesis, we've seen that one. When God created, he spoke and this creation came in chapters 1 and 2. Everything was good. Everything was awesome. No sin. But then when Genesis 3 came in, sin came in the world. Pain came in the world. Death came in the world. Suffering came into the world. And we know that's not, it's not if we're going to suffer, but when we're going to suffer. And here, the ultimate pain that Jesus points out is losing a loved one, is death. That's the ultimate suffering that we could all feel. And, and everyone in here, at some level, has faced death. So when, 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 when death happened to you, the question is, where do you go for help? Where do you go for peace? Where do you go for comfort when death hits you in between the eyes? Because usually death, I mean, there's sometimes where, you know, people battle with a disease and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of a, you see the, the downgrade. But even death, and when that happens, even when it's, you know, we know it's coming, it's still, there's a finality to it that, that you just, it's not like, well, the game's over. It's a different finality. But most of the time when death happens, it happens suddenly. And when that happens, where do you go? Where is your anchor? Where is your foundation? For, for many people, in particular many people outside the Christian faith, they don't have the rock of Jesus, they go to platitudes, right? And, and, and sometimes even, even us as Christians, we don't know how to operate when someone dies, so we just throw out these, these platitudes, such as sending you good vibes. What does that mean? Right? Hey, in the long run, this will only make you stronger. Hey, everything happens for a reason. Oh, they're in a better place. What? And again, the people that, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging their heart. People want to say that, that they have good hearts. They're trying to, they're trying to comfort, but they have no... If, if these sayings aren't tethered to Jesus, they're just empty, useless. They have no meaning. They have no power. They're just platitudes. That's why Jesus says he doesn't, he, doesn't give, he doesn't give Jairus a platitude. He doesn't say, hey, dude, this is going to make you stronger. I'm sending you good vibes. No, he says, do not fear, but believe. Believe in me. 
The, the word believe in, in the original language is, is, is a command in the present tense. It's not, it's not just don't believe, it's keep believing. I know you're in the midst of this deep valley, this deep trial. The, the worst news you could possibly get. And he says, keep believing. In this trial, keep believing in me. You, you, you came to me in faith. You, you, you came to me believing that I could heal her. Keep believing, Jairus. Keep looking to me. Keep your eyes on me, the object of your faith. I'm going to do something. Don't fear, but have faith. So Jesus puts these two words against one another, fear and faith. Usually because our first emotion when something happens to us negatively, when we start to suffer, we immediately go to fear. Right? Think maybe some of you in here have maybe lost a job. And the immediate response is, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do? I got, I got to provide for this family. What, how am I going to make any money? And all of a sudden, your, your, your mind goes to, to fear. Or maybe even in death. How am I going to live without that, without that person? Maybe if it's a spouse, maybe it's like, oh man, now I'm going to be living in isolation for the rest of my life. You have these fears that come over your soul. And Jesus says, the, the antidote to your fear is faith. The antidote to your de- uh, fear is faith. You see, faith and fear cannot live together. They're mutually exclusive, one says. When, when you're fearful, it's because we lack faith. I know when fear takes over my body, my eyes aren't on the Lord. My eyes are on the circumstances. And, and, and fear, that's what overtakes them. And I'm not resting in my faith, but when you have faith in the midst of those valleys and sufferings and pains, faith does what? It banishes fear. It banishes fear. Therefore, Jesus says the cure to your fears and my fears is faith in God when we're in the valley of suffering. Mark Hotelling told a story this past, uh, uh, this past week at man school. I think captures this fear and faith dichotomy. Um, he had uh, his last swim uh, to be counted as a Navy SEAL. He had to pass this swim under a certain amount of time in the ocean uh, to become a Navy SEAL. And Mark admitted, he said, I was a terrible swimmer. He says, I was a, I was a bad swimmer. And again, this swim was, was just uh, a big, big obstacle, his biggest obstacle to be him becoming a Navy SEAL. And even the instructor knew this. The instructor knew that Mark was a bad swimmer. And as he said this to Mark right before the swim, Mark, this is your silver bullet. This is what's going to get you kicked out of being a Navy SEAL. You're going to fail this. In fact, I don't even know why you're going to be even swim. I don't even know why you're going to even try to do this. And Mark, upon hearing that, again, right before the swim, it, he could have let fear overtake him. Instead, what does he do? He, he dropped to his knees and he prayed by faith. He said all the other guys were in the water and he was still on the beach kneeling and praying. And this is what he said. He asked, the, he asked the Lord for success. <laughs> and his prayer, this is what he asked. He said, he asked the Lord to send him a dolphin so he could just grab his fin and swim. Because I guess they had to do some kind of side swim, right? So you couldn't see the dolphin. That was his prayer of faith. Well, you know, they took their swim in the Pacific Ocean. I don't know how long it, it was. He said like a six, seven, eight hour swim. I don't know, in the Pacific Ocean. But in, in the Pacific Ocean, he said, in the wintertime, the current only one, runs one way, right? And we'll say north. And in the summertime, it only runs one way, south. Never changes. Winter always north, summer always south. Well, they were making this swim in, in December or January. So the water's cold. It's only going north. So the first half of the swim, he was swimming with the current. So he, all the guys make decent time because you're swimming in the current. And then they make the switch to swim the second half of that. At the moment he made the switch, the current changed directions. And instead of just going north, it changed and went south. Never happens. He made his swim time. The instructor was angry. Another quick little fact, his wife Stephanie knew about this swim, knew Mark's dilemma, and he might have been fearful of not passing. 
And so she went to work, and her work, her boss and them, let, let Stephanie pray for her husband the whole day. He made the swim. Mark could have been paralyzed by fear, but instead, that trial led him to exercise faith, and he prayed. Same with this woman. Do not fear, only believe. And again, this faith is not in some empty platitudes. It's not just, just, it's not just believe just to believe, or, or you've got to have perfect faith for me to do anything. That's not what Jesus is saying, because we know later on in Mark, it talks about the centurion that said, Jesus, if only you can, he says, if only... I'll heal you if you believe. And the guy says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. So it doesn't have to be perfect faith. Belief, perfect faith. It just has to be in Jesus. It's perfect faith if your faith is in Jesus. Then it's perfect faith. It's not in your ability. It's what he can do. He is the object of faith. Well, see, finally he gets to Jairus' house. Jesus takes, takes in just Peter, James, and John. And when they get there, there's already a loud commotion. Verse 39, and when they had entered the house, he said to them, why are you making such commotion and weeping? Uh, just real quick, Jewish funerals back then, when someone died, they would literally hire professional mourners to come to the house to mourn. And so, you know, at whatever, the funeral started at 10 a.m., the 10 a.m., the, the professional mourners would be there they would start wailing and crying. They, would, they had a, a way to tear their clothes. And, and also at this funeral, you'd have two flute players, which you also see in Matthew chapter 9. So that's where all the commotion is going on. The child has died. All of a sudden, the professional mourners are there. Everyone's weeping and wailing. No, no, you know. And Jesus asked this question. He says, why are you weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. So you saw how sincere their their, their mourning was. I mean, on an instant, as soon as he said this, they went from weeping to laughter. But they say, put them outside. Literally, Jesus pushed the, these people out of the house. This is like, get out of here. He pushed them out of the house. And he brought in the child's father and the mother. And those were with him. And he went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithia kumai, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly told them not to uh, tell anyone. No one should know this. But then he told her to give her something to eat. Because apparently you're going to be hungry if you die and are resurrected back to life. But isn't that a great little, isn't that a great little thing? Give her something to eat. Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Don't fear, keep believing. And what we see here is faith treats death like a nap. In Christ, the object of Jesus, faith treats death like a nap. Jesus says she is not dead but sleeping. We'll see that the New Testament writers pick up on this theme about death. And if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you're saved, they, 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 they take death and it's analogous to sleeping. We see this with Stephen in Acts chapter 7 when he gets stoned to death. It says that, that Stephen fell asleep. We see Paul takes up uh, this same idea in 1 Thessalonians 4 about believers are, are, are sleeping. Even though they're dead, that's, that's what these are. They're, they're sleeping. So for us in Christ, death is not a thing for us to fear. It's actually a thing for us to look forward to, like a nap. Um, we, have, we have many little kids in here, right? I, I had little kids. And, and when our kids were younger, uh, again, as many of you guys know, is they don't see naps as blessings, do they, right? In fact, they sound like the professional mourners, right? We have to take a nap. No, you know, wailing and weeping, right? And you might say, no, not my kid. Well, my, my wife watches some of your kids, and they do, all right, just for right uh, <laughs> Just kidding. We love them. We love them, right? And I'm sure I was like that as a little kid. But now, man, I love a good nap during the day. Who's with me? As you get older, you love a good nap, right? Why? Because you, you know a nap is going to rejuvenate you. It's going to rejuvenate you. And so we see, and also we know that the, the nap is temporary. A nap implies there, there's going to be an awakening. You go down for 30 minutes, you're going to wake up in 30 minutes, and you're going to feel refreshed and ready to go. And death for the believer, death for those of us who repent of our sins and trusted in Christ as our Lord and Savior, death for us is like a nap. That it implies there's going to be a, a, an awakening. And it's not, only going to, it's not going to take a while, it's going to be immediately. As soon as we take our last breath on earth, we take our first breath in heaven. 
A resurrection happens and we're in the presence of God immediately. Remember the thief on the cross when he died, Jesus says, hey, today you will be with me in paradise. And this should bring us hope this morning because the Bible, as I already pointed out, that death is our greatest enemy. You know, a lot of people might say, well, I can't believe in Jesus because of all the hunger in the world. Well, hunger is not our greatest enemy. Death is. Global warming is not our our greatest enemy. Death is. Our, Our government isn't our greatest enemy. Sin and death are. And when Jesus came, his life and his death and his resurrection took care of our greatest need. He took care of our sin, so we reconciled back to God, and he took care of death. Jesus used this again, this illustration of death being sleep with his good buddy Lazarus when Lazarus died. And to, cr- to confront Mary and Martha, he said this. He says, uh, your, you know, your brother is, is, is sleeping, but he goes on and says, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, the resurrection is more than just an event that happens, though it is. This little girl was raised from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. It is, a, it is an event that happens. But more importantly, the resurrection and life is a person. And that person is Jesus. In him is life and life abundantly. He goes on in verse 25 of John 11, and Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he or she dies, yet shall he or she live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So death, according to Jesus, is the way to life, in fact. He says those who believe in him really don't die. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Many of us have been to funerals. I've done a handful of funerals. And there's definitely a difference between a Christian, a believer's funeral, and then someone who doesn't know Jesus. Both both are filled with grief. Both are filled with sadness. Both are filled with questions of why. But the Christian funeral is, has a hope to it. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a feeling of hope in which people are standing on. And they don't say, hey, he or she is in a better place. No, they don't just say some general platitude. They say, he and she, we know they're with Jesus in heaven. In the mansion that he said he would be preparing for you. That's where they are now. There is a comfort there. When my mom passed away, <clears throat> we were there, and you know, a lot of people would say, describe this, I heard this little story. They come up to me, baby, I'm sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss, sorry for your loss. But here's the thing, something's not lost if you know where it is. Right? My mom wasn't lost, I knew where she was. And that brings a comfort, that brings a peace. Was there devastation mourning? Absolutely. Was I a wreck? Absolutely. Should we weep? Absolutely. But there's an, there's an interesting thing, and maybe you felt this if you've, if you've gotten in contact. For me, there was this interesting thing going on in my heart, devastated, because I wouldn't see my mom on this side of eternity, but also happy, joyful. And it was weird. But I was happy and joyful because I knew she knew that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. We don't need to fear death. So, if we believe that death and sin is our greatest enemy, and if we believe that Jesus is the resurrection and life, and he has conquered our biggest enemy, sin and death, how much more can we come And how much more can we believe in faith, by faith, that he has come to take care of you and your suffering now? If he's already conquered the biggest enemy, death and sin, that trial that you're in, that suffering that you're in, that that trial that I'm in, how much more can Jesus take care of it? It's it's easy for him because he's already taken care of the, the, the bigger need, the greater need. So the lesser will be no problem for him. So I want to leave you with the words of Jesus. If you're suffering this morning, Hear the words of a loving Savior, a loving Father, daughter, son. Do not fear, but believe. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this portion of Scripture. It is definitely 
food and, and peace for our soul. Lord, I know there's people in here suffering. Right now, they're in a deep trial and they're hurting. And I pray that today they would, they would see the examples of faith of Jairus and this young woman and make a beeline to you. Maybe it's for the first time. Maybe it's for the first time. Maybe, maybe someone in this room has been trying to get through this valley on their own and only to fail over and over again. Lord, my prayer is they would look not inward anymore, but upward. That they would repent of their sin and trust in you. And you, as you've promised, would come in like a, a, a river of living water and give them rest and peace. And for those of us that have done that, and you've already done that, Lord, and we still can time to do things on our own, and I just pray that you would cause us to look upward as well. To look upward and see that you are the one that can get us through this storm. And we need to rest in your goodness. Not fear, but believe in Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.